Growing up in small town Clayton, North Carolina, I never really saw anyone struggle for a basic human right. I did, however, experience this in a small rural village in the Central Plateau region of Haiti. It was 95 degrees and there was 100% humidity and there wasn't a cloud in the sky. The ground was hard and dusty and the sweat cemented my shirt to my back. I was working with a few villagers and I heard a noise, you know, commotion behind me. When I turned to look, what I saw forever be burned in my memory. I saw four kids, no more than six years old, fighting over who got to drink dirty, soapy water their hands had been washed with earlier. This struck a chord in me that I never felt before, and I left that village knowing that I wanted to do something about the world water crisis. Summer comes along, and I start an internship at a marketing firm, and things get crazy at work, so my I want to save the world mentality kind of had to take a back seat. <laughs> Late July, I woke up one morning with a Bible verse, Isaiah 12, 3, on my mind. I never really heard it, so I didn't really think anything of it. Morning routine and went to work. It kept coming to the forefront of my mind at work. Isaiah 12, 3. Isaiah 12, 3. So when I finally looked it up, Isaiah 12, 3 says, With joy you will draw up waters from the wells of salvation. I knew right then that that couldn't take a back seat anymore and that I was being called to help the world water crisis. <laughs> so I called my best friend Josiah and I told him, Man, I'm going to water the world. A little while later, I went and I painted my first absolutely terrible logo. <laughs> and I took that logo and I went to my parents and I said, I really wanted to start, you know, doing Water the World. So they became my two key venture capitalists. <laughs> After we talked about it, we went to work painstakingly creating prototypes in our state-of-the-art outdoor manufacturing facility our back porch. <laughs> when it got dark, we would move inside to our even more state-of-the-art manufacturing facility, the kitchen floor. We worked tirelessly until we came up with a prototype we really enjoyed, and we effectively named it Water on Wheels. So this is our product. With a 35-gallon tank and 1,100-gallon per hour pump inside, we can pump out water at six gallons a minute. Our product's completely solar powered, making it sustainable in any environment, and we can put 700 gallons through the system on a single charge. We use wa filters from Sawyer Water Filtration in Port Safety, Florida. They can take water that looks like this and make it safe and clean to drink for anyone. So this is more than a story about water in the world. This is a story about following your passion, about the universal quest to find and perform meaningful work. There are four key principles that have worked for me to have my own startup company, and I think they can work for anyone if it, you're willing to put the, apply them. The first, skip some stuff. Uh, first, you have to see the need. You have to step out of your comfort zone. The first time I went to Haiti, when I stepped out off the plane, I was completely out of my comfort zone. I almost turned around and got back on the plane and went home. <laughs> that was one of the first times I had traveled outside of the country and certainly one of the first times I'd been to one of the poorest countries in the Western Hemisphere. People yelling different languages, trying to take your bags, trying to sell you things. It was just wild. But to find your passion, you have to step out of your comfort zone. The second is you have, I, once I immersed myself into their culture, I really saw their need. And it so happens that their need became my passion. The second is you have to resist making excuses. I had to take every single tool out of the tool shed to break down all of the walls that life had put in front of me in adversity. The worst thing that we as a society can let the world do is tell us that our passion is not worthwhile. Once life knocks us down, it's hard to get back up and dust yourself off, get back in the ring and fight another round. But when it's your passion, it's the only thing that matters. Everything else loses taste. A baske former basketball player at my recent alma mater, High Point University, Alan Chaney, uses the hashtag positive adversity on all of his social media. It shows that what can good can come out of adversity. I think those two words, positive adversity, really embody what following your passion truly means. The third point is you have to be a leader. You have to go into things with your chin up and your chest out 
and make things work. My senior year spring break a few months ago, I had to walk into a meeting with one of, the, uh, one of the CEO of one of the biggest international aid organizations on the East Coast. And I was just a 22-year-old kid on spring break. I didn't know what I was doing. I looked good in a suit, and I walked in, and I just was, hey, man, this is what we want. You've got to go in there, and you've got to put it on the table, and you've got to put it on the line. And that's exactly what we did. Now, thanks to that, we can ship to 73 different nations globally. Thank you. You have to be a leader. You have to follow your gut feelings. There's been so many times where I've had tough decisions to make in my business where I need to decide who really needs the help. That's one of the toughest decisions I've ever had to make when we have systems to send out. Where do I send it? How do you decide who needs the help and who doesn't? There's people struggling in Africa. There's people struggling in South America, in the Caribbean, everywhere. But when you follow your gut feeling, it tends to work out. I like to live by the term, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So by using my gut feeling, we've succeeded. And the last point is you have to hustle. There's been plenty of times where I haven't slept for 72 hours straight just to meet a deadline. There's been times where my daily diet only consists of a bagel and a whole pot of coffee. <laughs> I was recently you know, a full-time undergraduate student and putting in full-time hours on my organization. There are plenty of times that I wanted to quit, but I knew I couldn't quit because people needed help. You know, there's a story that really... I really like about that. So one time there was a businessman and he got in touch with a guru who had been very successful in life and said, I want you to teach me how to be successful, man. I want it all. I want the money. I want the cars, the women. I want all that. So the guru said, all right, meet me at the beach tomorrow at seven in the morning. So the businessman gets to the beach. He's wearing his Armani suit and you know, ready to go. And the guru is halfway out in the ocean up to his waist. And the guru says, to be successful, you have to follow me out here. The businessman said, man, this dude's crazy. But you know what? I'll do it. So I took off his shoes, rolled up his pants, and went halfway out into the water. They kept backing up till they were almost neck high. All of a sudden, the guru grabs the man by the head and holds him under the water. Bubbles are coming up, and the guy's fighting to get up, and he almost passes out. So when the guru finally lets him up, after he catches his breath, he said, man, what are you doing? Why are you holding me on the water? You almost drowned me. That businessman, that guru looked that businessman in the eye and said, when you want to be successful as bad as you just wanted to breathe, then you truly have found your passion. The great Bishop T.D. Jakes once said, I would hate to live my entire life and never do the work I was born to do. What are you born to do? Find your passion, paint your terrible logo, and start. Thank you. <laughs>